Hello, this is Dan Alford, and you're listening to Dan's Cadre of Experts. Got an interesting guest on for you today, not out of the industrial segment, but uh, we have some shared interests and some shared goals, and she also has a very interesting history. We'd like to thank you for coming on, Viana von Weyhausen. Did I get that right? You did. Okay. All right. So let's start out. We met through a friend in Namibia. In Namibia. Marina. Limprich. Limprich. An icon of the country. Right. And uh, they run a, a safari outfit there. And uh, somehow or another, I don't know how you ran into her, but that uh, she was a mutual friend. They introduced us. And uh, I became intrigued with what you're doing. Yes. Well, um, just... I'm from Zimbabwe originally. Yeah, start, yeah let's, let's get all the way back. So you're African, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're I'm, African. I'm an African through and through. Yes. A, African. a blonde African. A blonde <laughs> African. <laughs> so I was born in Zimbabwe. What part? Bulawayo. Where is that? Matabili land. It's in the south. In the south. Okay. So and why was it that your family was there? My father was actually born in South Africa. And uh, he was a surgeon. And well, he was doing his studies in Trinity College, Dublin and he was due to go back to South Africa, but decided to go to Zimbabwe or Rhodesia, as it was at the time, uh, because they were looking for, there weren't that many you know, good surgeons there, and he went out there. He had met my mother in Ireland, so I'm half Irish, and uh, he set up his practice in Zimbabwe. And when was the, uh, the revolution that turned Rhodesia into Zimbabwe? Uh, s- now you've got me. Um, yeah, 60s? 69, I think. 69, so it was the 60s, before though. That. 60s, yes, right. maybe not 69. Yeah. But, so but he I, was there before he the did, revolution. Well, he actually, yes, he was before. Um, unfortunately, he died when I was a few months old, so I never knew him. Mm. And so a few years later, my mother took my brother and I to South Africa. So okay. I between Zimbabwe and the Cape. And uh, so I had a beautiful, natural, wild African upbringing or childhood. Then, uh, for sort of high school age, 13, we went to England. So we went for schooling in England. For school or for, or for what was it? Pretty much for schooling. In okay. those days, South African, I mean, they've got a couple of really good schools, but I just thought it would be more, give me more international outlook on life. So this was grade school? school? Yes. Okay. And then so the college, where was that? I came to America. Ah. Um, very last minute thing, I went to Duke University. I wanted to read medicine, just kind of, you know, be like my daddy. Uh-huh. And... Uh, Duke was one of the top medical schools right. in them, so um, I did my pre-med there and uh, actually ended up not going on and getting my full medical degree. I got my degrees in psychology instead and then went back to England after I graduated. To practice? To practice. I see. Wow, well, yes. And, okay. Um, so what does that have to do with conservation, which is the reason that we're, we're here today? I've... Just, I mean, I say it's because it's in my blood. You know, I'm an African, and therefore we have this. So I know there are a lot of Africans who aren't involved in conservation. It's just always been a passion. Um, my particular love are the cats, you know, so. These are big cats. Any cat. <laughs> Any House cat. cats. It to started off, yes, it was like, to lions. Was, I was like, you know, four years old, I was demanding a kitten. You know? And it just kind of grew from that. Um, so just mm-hmm. always an interest, always, um, mm-hmm. even when I moved back to London after university here in the States, I started working with other organizations. Um, I set up my own, we set up a lovely little organization called Wild Invest um, through, with a friend of mine who was in the, in the city, the finance, uh, just doing small projects around the world. So it's just to me, I can't imagine or remember a time when I wasn't somehow involved with conservation, not running my own organization as I am now but just passionate about it. And then I ended up going to Namibia, uh, though I didn't know Marina at the time, for months and months on end working with cheetahs. What was the cheetah project? There was a place called Africat at the time, which was very small. Now it's actually grown and it's a kind of reserve and it's open to the public. But it was just a Namibian farming family who uh, someone had given them a baby cheetah to nurse because they happened to be out there. And then that became two and then it became three and Then it came, you know, they actually set it up and they were doing rehabilitation and then rescuing cheetahs and then either reintroducing them to the wild or keeping them if they couldn't be reintroduced. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is my my version of Namibia. Uh, They they have various preserves, either public or private, and within those preserves, the animals run free. 
Uh, and But if they manage to get out of these preserves, then they become a pest to the farmers and ranchers and such. And so there's, there's limited areas for these cats uh, to live. Particularly for the cats. It also applies to like elephants who will destroy crops. I know there's a view, especially in the West, who want to protect these wild animals and, and beautiful and needs to happen, but aren't aware of the fact, I mean, an elephant is a beautiful, iconic animal, but not if it's stomping on your fields, right. you know, off the line, it's killing your children, you know, that there has to be a drawn line. Namibia is actually one of the best countries in Africa that has community projects. Um, historically, wildlife reserves were very much like a, a white Western view of you come down, you take a piece of land, you throw the people out and you put the animals in, you know, I animals see. are more important than people. We now know that doesn't really work very well. Um, and you need to get the local communities involved, give them jobs, um, have, have them a passion and an interest in keeping the animals, because you know, otherwise they're just using up land that the people would like to have. But Namibia has a lot of communal land, and the people there are now asking, for example, even for rhinos. We have groups who ask us to help them get rhinos, because they know if they have a rhino, the tourists will they come, get and tourists. Stay, they'll come and they stay in the house, and um, mm -hmm. whether that's hunting or not. You know? So, um, yeah, definitely, it's, 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 it's a complex issue. It's not you know, simple. And, and somewhere in all this, you squeezed some polo playing in. I did. <laughs> <laughs> how, did how did that fit? Um, <laughs> uh, my ego will tell you the story. Um, I was actually in Jordan with my brother, and he was a major scuba diver. <clears throat> and I was just early 20s, I think. And I was left... I didn't dive anymore. I'd had a diving accident, so I don't, didn't dive anymore. And my brother would go off and leave me in a Middle Eastern country, the first time I'd ever been to one, on my own, getting sunburned to death for like six hours while he went, went diving. So this lovely woman said to me, do you ride? She was the only person I came across. And she said, yes, she said, well, my husband has the polo club. And the polo club was, one of, was a piece of desert with a metal hut and a few stones around it. And this was the polo club. But anyway, I went. It was insane. It was, if you wanted to ride, the husband who was had, were very high up in the army would send some of the soldiers up to collect some wild horses and then <laughs> play on the stirred patch. Sure. But I felt, so I just thought if I was going to tell the story of when I was back in England, of you know when I was playing polo in Jordan, you know, it would sound impressive. Um, but I had no idea. So I went and booked a lesson. And I remember I... In, um, Royal Berkshire Polo Club, and I got on the horse and I hit the ball the first time, and it was like every cell in my body changed. And it was like, this is what I want to do with my life. <laughs> and for the next 10 years, that's what I did with my life. All over the world? All over the world. I was based at Guards Polo Club in England, and I had my own team. Um, even played high goal, which was, I think there were only like three women in the world at the time huh. who did that. Uh, mostly medium goal. Um, but yes, I would go to Argentina, and I would play in South Africa as well. So Argentina is where it all started? Uh, or is it? No, it's where it's the biggest. It actually oh, it's started biggest. kind of in Persia. Oh, I didn't so know. The oldest that. origins of Persia. And then, of course, the, it got very, very big in India during the Raj, because the British. And then everyone got taken over by the, the Argentinians. Partly because the polo, they're called ponies, because originally they were small little things. Now you use thoroughbreds and racehorses. Um, and the best. Ponies were criollos, which were bred the wild horses of Argentina. And of course, they're oh. amazing. The gauchos are amazing horsemen. So slowly, they just come over, and they, they've absolutely taken over the polo world. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and, then, the most and then how did you end up in Texas? <laughs> OK. Well, it wasn't a direct line. So from uh, London and practicing, um, and I also I went to the Sorbonne in Paris as well. So I lived in Paris for a while and uh, ended up going, uh, before I moved to Texas, I was living in Morocco for 15 years. Uh, I literally had some acquaintances, not even friends, who said, we would got a housewarming party in Marrakesh, why don't you come for the weekend? And I did, and I stayed 15 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> fell in love with the country, sold up everything in London, moved lock, stock and barrel to Morocco, and uh, Okay, was there, was there a conservation uh, no, content at that point? There, I mean, I was still already heavily involved, but there wasn't, because I lived many places, I would 
do is I would kind of, when I moved somewhere, I would go and see who was doing what in conservation and see what I could do to help. I see. Whether that fiscal on the ground, whether it was fundraising, whether it was introductions, whatever I could do. So I thought I'd do the same with Morocco, only to find that basically there was none. Um, Why is that? I don't, it's changed dramatically now in recent years, especially in terms of green and conservation. It just wasn't, you know, some countries have a passion for wildlife, but don't have the money to do anything about it. I was assuming it was money. Partly, Hmm. yes. I mean, for example, in the Middle East, um, there are countries where everything, like the oryx in, in the Emirates, which were hunted almost to extinction, but then there was the, they had the money, so between the money and the interest of other people to fix them, it got sorted. You know? um, other places don't have the money, but do have the animals. Morocco at the time, there were some amazing people working for, they call it OEFORE, which would be the Wildlife Commission, who were passionate, but there wasn't a knockdown from the top. So they were setting up a few reserves, um, but they didn't get very far. I had a very, perhaps arrogant, but dream is as there wasn't a national game reserve I thought I would set one up you know so it would be just call a couple of friends and import a few easier said than done Texas. <laughs> exactly yeah. and uh, so I then came up with a new idea which was um, because my passion is cheetahs and I want to do something for cheetahs and there is a Saharan cheetah but it's extremely endangered they think there's like 10 or 15 left and they are in Algeria not in Morocco ah. um, so I wanted to set up some kind of reserve that we could put cheetahs into. So I came up with the idea of hunting with cheetah. In the same way you hunt with a falcon? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. And this was something that was done historically. I mean, no medieval prince or king did not have his hunting cheetah. And it became huge in India as well. It's one of the reasons the Indian cheetahs were, it became extinct. So I had this idea of... Uh, you have your own cheetah, which is trained to hunt, um, but it's it's a pet. I mean, they're not exactly like your house cat, but they you know can be a <laughs> bit larger. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it would probably have been one of the most exclusive you know, sports or clubs. I would have made it a club in the world. You know, um, is this to to give the, the the cheetah a value to modern? people or, or my, what was the end goal here my idea was to make this so exclusive that it was really expensive and then to use all the profits from that into cheetah conservation oh i see it was a way of getting money into cheetah conservation which people weren't paying just to you know save the cheetah right so if you have some sheikh or potentate who pays a million dollars for his cheetah because there are only two people in the world who have one mm-hmm. you know so i had a lot of interest from the middle east um i had um Investors, people who want to do the kind of hotel side, it would have been a super, super, super luxury tent kind of thing as well, with the falcons, with I mean the whole thing. Um, and as a lovely side story to that, I was setting this up and uh, getting the word out, and a lot in the Middle East. And in my presentation pack, it shows what they did in the medieval times, which would the prince would ride out with the falcon on his arm and the cheetah sitting on a cushion on the back of the horse, and. This happened, and I was going to recreate this because my life with horses as well, so I thought, perfect, who better mm-hmm. to do it? And I had been disseminating my package, my presentation, and I'd actually gatecrashed the king of Saudi Arabia's house in Morocco. Um, I knew I wouldn't get to him. I knew he was in residence, but, um, but after six hours with the Secret Service um, as to what I was trying to get in, I got it to his number two. So anyway, a little while later, I get a call in London from a woman saying she represented the head of the Garde Royale of Oman. And would I meet with him? So of course I'm convinced he wants to fund my whole project and he wants something. So I met with this lovely man, General Abdi, in London. And what he actually wanted was for me to create the cheetah horse combination that he could make as a present or give as a present to the Sultan. And he thought I already had the horses and the cheetahs. <laughs> And unfortunately, I couldn't, but that would have been quite something. Um, so, no, it was a lovely idea. I mean, I worked on it two and a half years. Um, very I'm, different from what you're doing now. Very different from what I'm doing, but it was just, you know, think out of the box. You want to raise money, you know, mm-hmm. for cheetahs. And, and there was also a breeding program for the birds. They're called hubara. Um, for, the hunt, for the falcons to hunt, they hunt hubara, and they were going extinct. So I thought if we breed them up for this, then we release them into the wild. So it was a big project. Um, actually, I never 
project never really happened. Morocco gave me, the government gave me land in the south of Morocco, it was it got very far. And then I had a huge meeting in uh, Gibraltar, because I had Gibraltarian, British, and Emirati investors for the big meeting. And I was living in Tangiers at the time, and I drove across, and I never made it. <coughs> um, I actually uh, stopped off and then got rub robbed and mugged, and then I had a car crash. And I ended up for like 18 months. My. Not actually in hospital for 18 months, but it took me 18 months to get better. So I was wondering, you know, at the time it was just atrocious. You know, you never know, you know, someone up there giving, sending messages, to be quite honest. After the 18 months, it was, um, do I set it all up again and try and recreate all that kind of stuff? By which time the political climate had changed a little. Mm. Uh, Nigerian border was a little, you know, things were getting a little more politically problematical, so I'm not sure, you know, if the timing, the timing would have been right beforehand. So it was this dream, it was a beautiful dream. I don't know if it's a good thing if it didn't happen or not. Oh, one other thing I want to add to that, which was very important, because when I came up with the idea, this is fantastic, because I've worked with reintroduction of cheetah into the wild, and it's actually, it's an unpleasant thing you have to do, because if you think of what a wild cheetah mother does when she's got her young cubs, she'll go out and she'll maybe catch a baby impala or something, and she'll bring it back alive. alive. Or she'll bring it back wounded, yeah. or she will wound it, so the cubs can learn to kill. So it's pretty gruesome, you know? but that's what nature is. You that's know, nature. Yeah. So to reintroduce, to teach one of my ones to do that, people, do, I mean, when we're doing a reintroduction program, they will literally break an arm of a, you know, mm. less so now, but in the early days, you know, or a leg, mm -hmm. leg of the deer. And so it's, I'm just thinking, I can't do this to an animal just for the pleasure of some very, you know, wealthy people who want to have an unusual game. Until I realized that cheetah are one of the few, few, few cats that need to be taught to kill. I mean, if you take your house cat. House cats, yeah, I thought they were, it was ingrained yeah. in them. You, will, you throw her out, poor thing, um, she, will learn, she will hunt mice and eat them, you know, as will a lion or a leopard cub. Cheetahs, the, the instinct to chase is always there. You know, any kind of cat. You, um, but we've had problems with cheetahs who they would chase and not kill or they'd chase and even kill and then not eat. <laughs> so I suddenly thought, well, use that concept. So you reinforce the non-killing. So for example, the cub, you'd start with a cockroach and you would, it would chase the cockroach and then you'd reward it and then take the cockroach away. So that this plan was a catch and release, like your fishing catch and release. Mm -hmm. So the cheetah takes down the deer, it would chase, it would chase the black buck or whatever. It takes it down and then it leaves it and walks it away. Walks away. So that's when I decided to launch it because I had decided there's no way I could do it. Yeah. If cruelty was involved. You know, it's the animal. Which brings us to CSI. Yes. <clears throat> so I had been working with lots of other organisations or this idea of my own, and I just one day thought, well, I'm spending all my spare time and all my spare money on someone else's project. And some of them were fantastic. Some of them were organisations that too much money was going into administration or it wasn't going where it wanted or some of the big ones are just too big you know they become unwieldy so I decided I wanted to set up my own that I could run if I could find something that was manageable but really really impactful and so I had heard and this was about eight years ago I heard of a man who was doing using dogs in Kenya to try and protect wildlife. It was a trial. He was a British military vet and a veterinarian. This is anti-poaching? Yes. Yes, so explain that. And uh, so I found him, I went and talked to him and sort of stuff. And so basically what the idea is you, you take a dog and you train it to do anything to help wildlife conservation. So that can be anti-poaching as you say. So these dogs are trained to track humans um, usually to track weapons or arms as well. They are apprehension dogs, so if needs be, they will protect their ranger or they will actually apprehend a, a poacher who's basically firing at you. Um, but you told me that rare, your dogs rarely are used or rarely end up having to bite. They're more of a deterrent than a... They are. Um, the overall deterrent effect is now, in the beginning, people didn't quite know about them, so it took time. Now they're much better known. It's, I mean, this concept has exploded since I started. Everybody has a fear of dogs. Everybody, everyone has a fear of dogs, but 
nobody was doing this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were a few. It's, I'm not saying this is my idea or I started, but you know, I was just, you talked about the idea, even on game reserves, people was like, I had never heard of this. You know, now everyone's either got one or they know about it. Um, so now when you'll put in um, a dog unit or several dog units into a reserve, the word will get out, the bush terror uh, telegraph in Africa is, you know, very effective. Very effective, and I mean, we've had instances, multiple times, where the units go in. By the next day or the day after, our intelligence will tell us the poachers have gone somewhere else. Now, of course, they've moved from this reserve, which has the dogs, into a reserve that doesn't have dogs. You know, which is why everyone's now getting. Them. So the deterrent effect is huge. Um, but even when it isn't a deterrent, and there is, then we have. Most of the time, poachers, when they know you've got dogs, especially these dogs, they will, they'll just give up. They don't want to, you know, th um, they don't want to get into a fire fight with the rangers who've also got a dog, so they're, you know, mm -hmm. stuff. And they're more scared of the dogs than they are the bullets, basically. Right. So, uh, we, I would say 95, 98% of time, when there's a takedown, the dogs don't bite. You don't need to let them in there. Um, just the terror factor, and th when these dogs get worked up, they're scary, you know. But ours are extremely well tra trained. So, and where are you training these? Um, I've team. I have a partnership uh, with an amazing, amazing, amazing man in South Africa. Uh, it's in South Africa. It's uh, outside a town called Hutspreit, on the borders of the Kruger National Park. Conrad, um, amazing man, has been using dogs himself privately on the reserves for over 20 years, has been working in the bush for 30 years. I mean, I don't even think I could do this anymore without him. And now his wife, who works with him as well, Anka, so just fantastic people. Um, incredibly ethical, passion for wildlife and for dogs, and nothing else, you know, so they're a joy to work with. So we train all our dogs down there, and also we train the rangers, because there's no point just training a dog and handing it to somebody. So this is a permanent team, typically. It's a permanent team. So. One man, one dog. Yeah. Um, in an ideal scenario, we'll take a ranger who's already working in a reserve. So reserve contact me and say, look, we'd like a dog. Um, I'm a non-profit, so these are donations. And so we do intense assessment to see, you know, if the people are the right people, the land is the right people, if, you know, it's appropriate to put dogs in because they're not appropriate everywhere. And if we go ahead, we will take one of their rangers. And that's the most critical point is choosing the right ranger who has an affinity to the dogs, because a lot of people in Africa are scared of them or just aren't used to them. You know? And they come to us, we train them, it's usually a 60-day training course, and it's independently assessed as well, so they have to pass the tests and the exams. And we have trained the dog up beforehand, and then those 60 days they work with the dog that they're going to go back with. And then that dog goes back with them to their reserve where they started. And it's better that than imposing someone from the outside uh, because sometimes even other rangers are scared of the dog, either physically scared of it, or they're worried the dog will take their job, you know, the dogs, because ah. yeah? these dogs can co cover huge areas, you know, that, and stuff. Um, but we do a lot of integration work and we do follow-up training, it's a whole package deal that we do. And uh, then there aren't any tribal issues, they're used to the ranger already, so the dog is the only new thing, not the whole unit. And they are... They're incredibly effective. I mean, the reason I chose this concept, as opposed to other possibilities like drones, as all other things, um, I like the idea of using animals to save animals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a green concept. It's simple. It's small. Uh, because of the deterrent effect, it's difficult to say. I mean, I have donors who say to me, "Well, how many dog, how many poachers did my dogs catch this year?" And it's like, well, there aren't any poachers left because the dogs, they won't come in because the dogs. You it's know? a deterrent. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so it's difficult to give actual statistics, but there's a quote from uh, the South African Wildlife College, which is based in Kruger National Park. And it's one, it, it's one of the world's leading or Africa's leading training centers and research centers for wildlife conservation, for training rangers as well. They, they train game rangers. And they did the statistics because they have dogs in Kruger National Park. And uh, she said that without a dog, the chances of ca in the past of catching someone, let's say who's come in and killed a rhino and gone off with a rhino horn, was about five or six percent, your chance of catching it once they've left the reserve. 
if you put the canine units in, that can go up to 60 to 80 percent. That's tremendous. So game changes, yeah, really, for a very, very small amount of money relative to what some, anything else would, would cost. So what's it take to train up a dog and a man? Um, financially, you mean? Yes. We, I, donors give me a $35,000 is the whole package, but this isn't just the range. It, it involves... Um, it basically covers everything. So if the ranger is in Nigeria, that will cover his flight down from Nigeria oh, I see. to us. It's a package. Plus the training. Yes, yes, because people say dogs don't cost that much, you know. Um, it's the ranger. It's his travel. It's his econ accommodation. Three months. It's his full package. It's his independence. It's the dog. It's, it's equipment for the dog. And it's follow-up training after they've gone back. And how long, what's the dog's uh, career time, period? With we say on average seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Okay. That's on average. I mean, accidents do happen. Um, happen less. I mean, a lot of the problem, for example, we snake proof our dogs. So you train the dog as they do in Texas. So it's right. A few same places here. where people actually know about this concept. Um, or when they're working, they work. They don't run off after, you know, an impala that runs past or something. So unfortunately, it's a field where a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon. And sort of security companies who have dangerous dogs, um, even people are putting pit bulls and things out there, and calling them conservation wildlife dogs, you know. And it's not. I mean, a huge amount of training goes into these things, you know, like a year's worth of training. And the rapport between the handler, that's why we almost never will we put a dog out unless we've trained the handler as well. I because see. That's the, it's, it's the joint, you know, between the two that's critical. So this is rhinos, elephants, what, what, what all are you? Almost anything, because those we're talking about were the, what we call the anti-poaching dogs. We also do a lot of detection dogs. So this will be for finding the ivory, the rhino horn, pangolin scales. Um, we also do arms, drugs, because very often you can search for drugs. And then this, because especially at that level of poaching, it's the same people who are doing arms and drugs and human smuggling are doing in wildlife crime. You know, so it's basically um, criminal cartels who are trying to make money. And if you think about it, it's easier to smuggle one rhino horn than it is, you know, X kilos of, of cocaine or drugs or, you know, hmm. 10 people. So we're dealing with the same people. So it's a you know, stuff. And this is limited to Africa? No. Um, it started out, in fact, when I started the organization, it was called Canines for Africa because we just did dogs and we just did... Africa. Yeah, you haven't even told us what CSI means. No. Everybody else thinks it's a <laughs> crime right. scene investigation, yes, exactly. but there's another meaning, right? There's a meaning, there is. So the word started getting out of what we were doing. And so we were contacted by some people in India. And uh, we trained up some teams, uh, brought the guys over, uh, working on pangolin and tiger. Tigers, huh? Tigers, tracking tigers. And uh, have been hugely successful in India. I mean, I'm very lucky. The man who was working out the who came across that we trained, a Kiran, fantastic man, actually an ecologist rather than just a ranger. And literally of last week, you were the first one to, person to hear this, we're going, I'm going to be setting up a satellite training center in India. That's got to simplify quarantine. And it is. It's also, I, especially in Southern Africa, in Africa in general, but in Southern Africa, the, the concept of dogs is becoming well known. Okay? There are a lot of countries where it's not known. So my goal now is to start putting into countries, I mean, Bangladesh, Vietnam, you know, Suriname, anywhere where there aren't these dogs or there are very, very few, so that other people can see how effective they are. And then other people can, more than happy for other people to start doing it, but if I can get it, the word out as well as the units. And that's what's happened in India. And there's now more demands because of that. Um, I have a lovely story about Indian dogs. Please. It comes back to Namibia. Uh, cheetah in, in India they became extirpated in the 1950s. And there's been, since then, concept of trying to reintroduce them. But there aren't enough Asiatic cheetah left. There are a few in Iran, but we couldn't get them from Iran. Iran wouldn't release them. So came up this project of bringing them in from Namibia. I read about this. Yeah. So it was controversial because it's a subspecies. Now, from my point of view, it's a cheetah. If we can save it in the world, and, you know, and it, it, they can survive in India, and Indians want them, put them in India. So I was very happy. So the cheetah, initial cheetah came from Namibia, um, from Cheetah Conservation Front, Laurie Marker. She's the other person in Namibia. Um, and 
they initially set up a cheetah. So I wasn't involved with that, but I spent months, if not years, down there, as I said. And then the person who basically financed most of this trip was um, Hamish Harding, lovely man, friend of mine. Um, you might know the name. He was one of the people who went down in the Titan, on the way down to the Titanic, the submarine that imploded. Was he on that one? He was on that one. Oh. So um, I'm a member of the Explorers Club. I was going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. And we have to get back to CSI. Um, and both Laurie and Hamish are also members. And the Explorers Club has what they call flag expeditions. So if you're doing something extraordinary in the world of exploration or scientific, mm -hmm. you know, work, you get a flag. And so we had our annual ECAD event. So what happened is the cheetah were flown up. And when you do a reintroduction, they put them first into a, a boma, an enclosed area, just to right. monitor them. Say that again. Then you do a kind of soft release into a small, I mean, it could be, you know, several hundred acres kind of. Same concept. thing we do in Texas. Exactly. Yeah. And then they go into the wild. So what happened is they were in the boma, everything was okay. They were due to be released in a couple of days into the small, small enclosure. And this was a big thing. You know, President Modi was there. I think the president of Namibia was coming up. The World Press was there. It was a huge event. And someone found leopard spore, paw prints, in the ground in that first in release enclosure. Mm. And so they couldn't do the release. And they were sending people out all over the place trying to catch. Leopards eat cheetahs. They would eat them. And it, the stress would just be that much more. Even if it didn't mm. kill them, the stress would have been atrocious. So panic stations. Until someone says, hold on. There's a dog units in India that track tigers. I wonder if those would track leopards. So they brought my dog in, a unit in. It went out first day. They found the leopard. They um, trapped the leopard, relocated it, and the whole cheetah relocation thing went ahead. What that is. So, you know, I, I have, having spent all that time where the cheetah came from, having a friend who was funding it, um, and then my dog was kind of rescued. Excellent. Like Rex at the event, and actually when I was at the Explorers Club event and they were up on stage, I, I was actually in the audience and he was kind of like, me, 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 me too, I should be up there. <laughs> should have just stormed up onto the stage, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and you told me some stories about some other animals. For example, turtles and oh, dolphin and, yes. and canoes. Yes, yes, and yes. There's no so, end to this. You seem to be getting yes. inquiries from all Absolutely, places and yes. all types. Yeah, that's... Um, that ties in with wanting to go to countries, you know, that this idea doesn't know. And the dogs, I mean, are incredibly versatile. So, I mean, coming back to one of the Indian things, it doesn't just have to be animals um, in terms of finding animals. There's a huge amount of development going on in India through the forests you know, and the jungles. And what's happening is they're building the roads and then the animals, as they are in America, are crossing the roads and getting killed. Mm. So when you're talking endangered tigers and all this, it's, it's really tricky. So my units, we brought them in, so they would find the pathways, the wildlife pathways in the bush, and then build overpasses or underpasses where those animals went. Um, and Excellent. the Indian government is, I mean, they're really great to work with. And so there are all these passes, underpasses, thanks to these units, the canine units, who found those passes and know where to put them. So it's not just that, but yeah. Um, so I mean, Africa, it's pangolin um, but also, I mean, we use the dogs to find invasive species, particularly plants that they want to take out, or the opposite, endangered species of plants. So you can train the dogs. It doesn't just have to be animals. Um, it's something a drone doesn't have is a nose that can detect everything okay. from uh, explosives, firearms, animals, people. Yep. yep. Can't replace um, that. No. No, I can't. But yes, so I've been, I've been asked to do a orangutan project. Where will that be? In Malaysia. Okay. Um, a friend who does bonobos in the DRC. Um, I mean, almost any any kind of animal. And then, um, yes, one day I was thinking, it's a shame I can't do marine work. You know, lovely stuff. But you got a dog. What can you do with the dog? And then suddenly I thought, well, turtles come onto the land. True. So I started investigating this, and I am inundated with requests for a turtle dog. I haven't, we haven't what trained What will a turtle dog do for a living? Primarily, find the nests. Because when the turtles come up, yeah. you know, if they, if, obviously the tracks are there, but once the tide has come in, they're gone. Nope. So a dog can 
um, travel huge distances and will be able to just smell out very, very easily the eggs. So sometimes it's purely that. So people with the endangered species now, what they'll do is they will collect all the eggs and then they'll put them in incubators. Excellent. I, I was just down on an island in the Caribbean, and apparently there had been a hatch the night before. Uh -huh. And the, no, that's bad news. Uh, the beach was littered with little little dead turtles that yeah. didn't make it. Cause yes. it's, uh, that's why they have so many, because so few do make it. Um, I suppose the, the incubator technique has a higher success rate, I would hope. It has a much higher success rate, and then they can put them all into the sea. There's another reason. It's not just that the babies get killed. When turtles' eggs are laid, the sex is not decided. They can turn either male or female. So it depends on the climate, the temperature, basically, of the nest, whether they become male or female. And with global warming, the temperatures are higher, so they are now producing way more males than females. So even if all of them survived, there's no point, because there's not enough breeding couples. Ah. So they put them back into the ideal temperature. So Refrigerate them. Make so more girls. 50, 50. <laughs> Fascinating. So, yeah, so there's almost um, endless, you know, supply of animals or countries where we can do this. Um, I'm actually, so you asked, go back to another question, how come I'm here by Texas? Right. Um, you haven't even woven in A&M yet. I haven't, exactly. So there I am sitting in my house outside Marrakesh and got a call from a friend in Dallas who said, would I take a call from a professor at Texas A&M? I said, sure. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of days later, I get the school. And basically, I mean, A&M is an amazing university and renowned for its um, outdoor work, you know, ecology and conservation. But it does tend to be America-centric. It doesn't do that much abroad. And so this particular professor, Bill Fox, wanted to kind of see if they can incorporate some stuff in Africa in their project. Just there was no specific you know, idea, but just, you know, let's speak. So. Um, we had a lo lovely talk. He said, would I be interested in working with them? And uh, you know, I was thinking kind of like consulting in some sort of way, and I said, sure. And then he said, well, would you consider coming to, you know, to, to A&M, Texas? So it was like, why not? You know, I'm always up for an adventure. I assumed everyone wanted to live in Texas. <laughs> I mean, I ended up in Morocco on a whim, so why not on a whim, you know? But it, in my mind, it was all just kind of, you know, potential ideas. And about three weeks later, I get paperwork saying, well, here's all your paperwork. And then it's like, you know, this is what you need to get your visa to get in, which took another couple of weeks. And then within a few months, here I was. <laughs> and the term is visiting scholar? Visiting scholar. Um, so, and ironically, I ended up not doing an African project with them. Uh, but I've set up a jaguar conservation project in Mexico. Because that's the other, the third leg um, of the stool. So there's the anti-poaching dogs, there's the detection dogs for finding contraband, the illicit wildlife trade. And then the third one is scientific research. So we use these dogs for um, projects, mostly with someone who's looking for scat, for, them, for animals to find out if the animals are there. So this one in, in um, the Yucatan in particular, one will be an anti-poaching dog, because the jaguar poaching is going through the roof. They're building roads. They're building rail lines through the jungle. So right. there's a lot of poaching. But the other one is specifically for research. And I've got it so that I mean, it's not operation yet, but I've got it so all the, whether it's the vet department, the genetics department of A&M, and they will tie in with um, the Universidad Nacional de, of Mexico. Um, and the dog will be finding scats, so they can find out you know, whether or where they are, the male-female ratio, genetically are they two inbred to breed, so anything that can be done scientifically. And a lot of that, our work does that as well, so for any scientific research anywhere in the world. Sounds like fun. So yeah. how can someone help you if, they want, if, if they're intrigued with all of this? Oh, that's, um, well, I mean, I am 100% non-profit, so uh, a lot of people donate, want their own, it's their own dog, if you like. So that's what I explained, that package. Right. So you have individuals who will name the dog as a present for their kid, you know, or companies who use it as promoted. So, um, and, and that's the book, right? And that's, that's the book. Okay, so that's one of, you, one of your dogs. How do you pronounce yes. MP? Mpizi. 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 And Mpizi means uh, hyena. Because he looks a bit he like a... He looks just like a hyena. And, 
Um, so, so that's the the story of his training, his his uh, handler, and his job. It is. This is a book um, I made for the for the donor of MPC, and so yes, it starts off as a puppy and all the way through his training and his handler and where. What he kind is. of dog is he? Or he is. This is a beautiful. We got a few of these. He's a cross between a Dutch Shepherd and a Malinois. Because we use for the for the anti poaching the apprehension dogs, they're all the shepherds. Dutch, Malinois and German shepherds and crosses. And that's pretty much all we use. Um, we also for the detection dogs, they tend to be um, occasionally Malinois, but most we use um, you call them Weimaranas, yeah. Weimaranas. Yeah. Um, which a lot of people say you can't do what we do with them, and that's nothing to do with me. That's this marvellous Conrad who just has a passion for the breed and has the time and um, is willing to put in the time to train them. But they make an amazing dog because they have the nose of a hound, if you like, but they've got a bit more oomph. Yeah, they'll run forever. <clears throat> they'll run forever. Um, we have uh, we've bred a couple of DBs. Which are? A Doberman cross bloodhound. What, what are you trying to achieve? <laughs> Well, the bloodhound has the best nose of any dog. I see. So as a tracker, it's best. Can't beat them. But they're a bit lugubrious out. They often don't take the dry heat in Africa. They can't handle that. And also, if they track and you find a, you know, a group of poachers who've got rhino horn and they come with AK-47s, the, the bloodhound doesn't do a lot of good. It doesn't, they don't look very dangerous. They don't look very dangerous and they don't exactly attack. Um, the Doberman, on the other hand, is too intense. They, won't listen up. They don't. They don't work well as a breed for what we're doing. Again, just too much energy, not enough focus on on, on their owner. But if you cross them and you get the nose of the bloodhound and you get the oomph of the Doberman, we've got an absolute machine. They are amazing. So we've got the DBs. Um, we we'll use spaniels occasionally. Very special. You want to um, search small areas, like you can put them into the engine. You just toss them into the engine. And they go, oh, we have what I believe is the world's only flying dog. How does that work? It started um, just on a routine search with um, one of our shepherds, actually. We'd gone into an African... We, we knew the poacher was there, and we knew he had poached. And went in, and the dog was searching the little rondavel, you know, the African rondavel. And the dog kept on jumping up onto the wall. And people were saying, well, this dog's no, no good, it's not working, you know. And, and Conrad knew that it was. And so... We ended up moving a table against the wall, and the job dog jumped mm. up on the table. And what we worked out was that some, that's what someone had done, um, because the dog is tracking the sole of the man's foot, right. amongst other things. You know? And the man had got on the had put on the table, and his footprint was on the wall, and he had jumped up into the rafters. Was he still there? Not him, but his gun was. Ah. And so the dog had picked up that he had been up there. And so we climbed up, or they climbed up, and got it, and they found him and we arrested it. But it got us thinking. You know? So we now have the spaniel training. <laughs> so you take the spaniel, and the dog, think, the dog think this is the best game it's ever had, and we throw it, and it flies up into the rafters, and then it runs around in the rafters. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while to get him to come back down again, though. Yeah. So. And it does. The dog just loves doing this, and... That way you can search the roofs. They like their jobs. They like their jobs. So we have a, a flying anti-poaching dog. Um, Interesting. Okay, so what's your what's a, a website? So how do we contact okay, you? Okay, so um, somebody might be getting exactly. interested. Exactly. So because Canines for Africa was growing internationally, um, I decided we needed an umbrella organization, uh, which also allows me to bring in other, for example, drones are getting more advanced now, and right. so we can tie them in. So that's called Conservation Solutions International. CSI. What's the website? CSI Wild. W I L D. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, and it is ties in nicely because everyone knows CSI. Right. The program and we do do crime scene investigations. I mean, when we find a carcass, the dogs we we will put that tape that the cops put around, and the dogs are trained to find casings. So we need those casings for um, for the court cases to prove that you know tie the gun in exactly the same way you would do it. These are spent yeah. rifle rounds. Yes. So um, CSI. So CSI Wild. We have a donate button there. Um, whether that's someone wants their own unit. Can I have half a dog? 
You can have half a dog. Can you get you buy can, them in shares? That. You can buy just his tail if you like. Okay. <laughs> so yes, I mean everything. Everything helps, and of course, money goes in South Africa goes very far. You seem to be in everything. What's uh? If, if, do you have any other future plans beyond what you've already described, orangutans, turtles? Um, no, I mean, I'd love to do the turtle, get that going. Mm -hmm. um, the other exciting thing is once I get the Jaguar project up and running, I mean, I don't in need... In Mexico? A, in Mexico. Um, I don't need a proof of concept. I've got eight years of lots and lots of proof of concept. Um, but the whole of Central and South America is just virgin territory for what we're doing. So this, I want to show that... Um, as a showcase and probably then also set up a small training center in Mexico. Um, possibly, and that's another thing, I won't say too much about it because it's just a few days old, but I'm talking with someone of maybe setting up a, a breeding and training center here in Texas. In Texas? In Texas. And then export the dogs or use them here? Bit of both. Um, the person I'm looking to do this business with, um, she does similar to what I do, but she does it for police, American police. So she raises the funds. Um, and it's called Canines for Cops. Amazing woman, amazing organization. And then instead of the money going for dogs for conservation, they go for they donate them to police forces. So we would do both the cops and um, Americans. And there's no reason why I can't get an American trainer to train in America and then send these dogs out the same way I do in Africa. So that's an exciting potential. Okay. And I can also A and M is interested in getting involved. So as I'm part of A and M, um, and in fact even my um, project, the Jaguar project, the funds we're raising for that, those funds go to A&M. So any of your Aggie friends who are listening, ah. that's a donation to, to A&M, not yeah. to my organization. Fascinating. So you get, you get a lot of things going on all at once. I do. I mean, I'm just so passionate about this, you know. Um, it's so exciting. It's so diverse what I'm dealing with, you know. I, the reason I approve is, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather these people be apprehended and stopped than shot. And I, and I, I think you, got, you guys are doing a good job with that, and that's yeah. why I approve of your program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's, this is a small part, you know, of, you know the, the whole protecting wildlife and protecting people um, is much broader than this. This is just one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But what we do, when we catch... The little poachers, which would be just, um, you know, not part people who are part of the syndicates and all that. These are often people who don't want to be poaching at all. They're just hungry, you know? Right. And so... Hard to blame them. And hard to blame them, exactly. So a lot of these people, when we, we have quite a number of our rangers, are <laughs> reformed poachers. Rehabilitated. Rehabilitated. <laughs> Excellent. Re recycled. Um, they're just so happy to have a job, you know, to not be doing something illegal. And, and they've got tremendous And they're knowledgeable. knowledgeable. They know. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. That, that's a, we're very proud of that program we have. Well, interesting. What, what did we miss? What did, what did I skip over? Got the website. Give us the website one more time. CSIWild.org. Dot org. And we have Instagram, which is the same thing. CSI.wild. Um, so most of that's, you know, yeah. Most of that. We've also, um, unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me today, but we also have a comic book. Um, That's mostly for Africa, you said. It's, well, it was originally the idea because it's just the story of, you know, it's done for, for children. Well, it's done for children. The adults seem to like it just as much. But um, the story of poaching, why it's bad for poaching, not just for the animals, but for the people as well. And right. the idea, so I've disseminated this to a lot of schools. In, um, in Africa, so the kids can see this. But I mean, I've had so many requests to send this out. I mean, I send it out digitally for free. I'm not making any money out of this, just so they can educate. But a lot of schools in, in America have it too. And then contact you through the CSIWild.org. Yes. Okay. Okay. But, uh, well, then, very good. I've I enjoyed having you on. I, I approve of what you're doing. Um, I'm intrigued with what you're doing. And uh, maybe we'll need to get you back on next year and. Uh, Get an update. Give an update on all the new countries we're in. I'd be delighted to do that. Well, until then, thanks for coming. Thank you.